These are all of the tapes in chapter three of Poppy Playtime, and we're gonna be analyzing each and every one to not only figure out what happened in them, but why they even exist in the first place and how they help convey the story of Poppy Playtime. There are 13 of these tapes, with each having a role for at least something regarding either the gameplay or the actual lore. So with that being said, let's start with the first tape. The first tape we're going to look at is Elliot Ludwig's opening speech, which actually has the least amount of lore to it, other than the fact that it gives us a bit of insight on how Elliot Ludwig was as a person and his thoughts towards the creation of Playcare. However, it's a bit weird having this as a tape, knowing the events that happened soon after his death, as we've heard in Home Sweet Home. It was said that an orphan was found dead in a body bag with vital organs and parts of his skeletal structure missing, and this is likely because Playtime Co. needed them to enact on the experiments that they had going on, specifically the Bigger Bodies Initiative. Anyway, in the tape, Ludwig talks about how there are few people nowadays who smile, and the fact that there's nothing more gratifying to him than the smile of a child. And so, he announces the creation of Playcare, Playtime Co.'s very own on-site orphanage beneath all the machines, the game station, and anything that would resemble where the staff have to work at. Now, the weirdest thing about this entire project is the fact that the environment is all artificial. The sunlight, the sky, the grass, and anything that has to do with nature. It leads me to believe that Ludwig always planned on doing something with the children, whether that be experiments or something else. A smile is hope. A smile is love. A smile is understanding. And there is nothing more gratifying to my soul than being the reason for a child's smile. To be the spark that ignites all their hopes and dreams, for it is only through hopes and dreams that we may create a better world. One where our children need not be afraid, one where they are protected. After all, this company and its toys are nothing without them. These children deserve to smile, they deserve to love, and they deserve a safe home. That is why it is with enormous pleasure that as the founder of Playtime Co., I announce Playcare, our very own on-site orphanage. In this next tape, which is the very first tape that we see in the game, a woman by the name of Claire Harper was questioned by an anonymous counselor regarding the events surrounding Mary Payne, a girl in Harper's care. Harper started to explain that Marie saw something horrible that caused her to start screaming and move erratically after Catnap used the red smoke to put the kids to sleep. Harper initially believed she was dreaming, but upon approaching Marie, she noticed that her lips have become blue, her eyes have dilated, and her skin is hot to the touch. And when asked what she saw, Marie said that it was a colorless monster. And when Harper says that she wants to see how Marie is doing, the counselor tells Harper that Marie is being watched over by medical staff and that she will be okay. But Harper is disappointed by this response and angrily yelled at the counselor, demanding Mary be given back to her. All right, Miss Harper, please explain the situation. Spare no detail. Well, luck any not. All the children were getting asleep. It was peaceful, quiet. Catnap had the red smoke in the room. Then suddenly, there was this scream. <sighs> Nightmares happen, I know, but this, I mean, dilated pupils and quivering lips. The way her eyes darted around the room, and I swear, her hand and mine, it felt like her blood was boiling beneath her skin. <sighs> she saw something, too. Something horrible. She... Uh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. Miss Harper, we'll provide the very best care we can offer. You have my word. But this is important. Did Marie happen to describe what she saw? Yes. A monster, she said, said that it was colorless. Gosh, I could feel the poor little heart pounding. For her, it was right there. And her movements, they were so wild. Arms flailing, legs kicking. Hmm. I, I want her to talk to her, see how she's doing. I, I just, I really need to hear her voice right now. That would not be advised, Miss Harper. There are many concerns we must address at this time. But vital, show normal, and we'll continue to monitor. She'll be okay. No! Girl, back to me. 
Now, this tape is a pretty quick one, as it's just the tutorial for the new Grab Pack 2.0 that we managed to get our hands on a bit later in the game. It basically lets us know that this new and improved Grab Pack has extended wire length, easy hand swapping, and air jets, so you essentially take zero fall damage, though you might have to watch where you end up landing. The fourth tape we're going to be looking at is the tape that we find inside of one of the rooms in Home Sweet Home, and it's essentially just an introduction video to all of the new employees who decide to work here. In the tape, a supervisor welcomes new hires to Playtime Co. and assures them that they will find their new family to be as caring and supportive as their own, all the while showcasing a regular and happy image of Huggy Wuggy. The supervisor then lets them know that they're able to observe the kids, stroll the hallways, or even take a seat in the mess hall. The man also offers them to join the science innovationists or the play care counselors, which, if I'm not mistaken, are the roles that are very involved with the experiments. But but from this point on, the tape gets scarier and scarier due to the red smoke that we inhaled upon entering Home Sweet Home. Huggy's face gets more twisted and grotesque, and the supervisor calls the player out for coming back to Playtime Co. years later with a new sinister tone of voice, claiming that the toys are watching and waiting to eat the player. And at the very end, the supervisor says, welcome home, as the tape stops, and then a nightmarish version of Huggy Wuggy emerges from the TV and chases the player down the hall, eventually killing us and having us wake up from whatever nightmare or hallucination we were just in. Greetings, employees, and welcome to your first day here in Playtime. We're certain that in the days to come, you'll find your new family here every bit as loving and supportive as your own. Feel free to wander the halls, sit in the mess for lunch, or watch our children play and learn to their little heart's content. Join the innovationists where the bounds of science are continuously pushed. Or join the counselors of Playcare whose diligence and care for our children will help shape a brighter future. Just you see. Now, every one of you has your part in that future, so should you come back tomorrow feeling unhappy for where you are, or what you've done, worry not, for your supervisor is here and happy to listen. And... Should you come back years later, your conscience finally getting the better of you, may you descend into the dark and the dust, finding all that awaits you are incomprehensible horrors, each hungry for your return, each eager that they might find you. Perhaps they'd smile at you from a shadow, their smiling mouths full of teeth and meat and plastic, watching and waiting patiently for their turn at a warm welcome. Or perhaps they won't allow you such time to figure your place in the world you'd left, a world that's theirs now. Welcome home. Now, it's unknown why this actually popped up in the hallucination, but I'm led to believe that this is because we, the player, are scared of Huggy Wuggy. Or it could be the fact that Huggy Wuggy is a very iconic character in Poppy Playtime. But whatever the case is, it's pretty safe to say that this second half of the tape was not supposed to happen for the other employees. This fifth tape is known as Samuel Lee's Last Day, which records what sounds like Miss Delight and the children of Playcare celebrating the adoption of Samuel Lee, with the children having no idea of what's actually going to happen to him. Now, I'm led to believe that whenever a child is adopted and sent off, the celebration that they end up having is just masking the fact that the child is going to be turned into a toy later on. And it's possible that kids like Theodore Grambell got this exact same treatment. Ah, and here they all are. Well, of course. They'd never miss this. Look at this He's going away. Oh, tell us. Shh, 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 shh. This week, Dr. White here has selected our very own Samuel Lee. Yay. Now, before he goes, let's all give Sam one last goodbye, shall we? With me. One, two, three. Goodbye, Sam.
The sixth tape we're going to be looking at starts with the log report regarding experiment 1322, an unknown toy with neural problems that needed to be addressed. But during this, a child by the name of Joseph walks into the room, interrupting the scientist, and he asks what they're doing to his friend Kevin. He even asks if Kevin is sick, to which the scientist says that he is very sick, and they had to move him away from everyone else to receive proper care. He even reassures Joseph that when he's able to see Kevin, he'll have never been better. Subject is stable. Designated 1322. Two. Clear neural abnormalities were detected in his recent checkup. Though highly irregular, we've pulled him from the home sweet home just before lights out to perform... What are you doing with my friend? I... What are you doing out of bed? How did you get in here? Is Kevin sick? Why did you take him away? I... I... Yes. Kevin is very sick. Very, very sick. But we want to make him better. But he can only get better if we take him to where we can provide proper care and give him proper rest. Well, do you really think he will be okay? I should think so. We're good at what we do, son. We paid attention in school, learned, and got our proper rest when we needed it. Just like you need it now, I should think. Come now. Let's get you on back to bed. Okay. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Joseph. And I promise you, your friend will be all right. When you see him again, he'll have never been better. Now, when the scientist says that Kevin will be a lot better, this is pretty much indicating the fact that he's gonna be turned into a toy, and that's apparently better than him just being a normal kid. And it's clear that Kevin was the first of many kids that went through this, as by the time this recording was made, they had already had experiment 1322. But as far as the kids' identities go, their names pretty much aren't brought up after this tape, so it's unknown what actually happened to them, specifically Joseph. During this seven tape, Miss Delight talks about her brief conversation with this mysterious person and about how she asked where the kids were and if she's able to see them. But the person declined this and Miss Delight says that's all he would tell her. But after this, she begins to laugh, saying that the person didn't reveal the kids location, probably because he knew that Miss Delight would kill them all. Where are the kids? Please, where are the children? Are they... In the same place as the employees? No. Are the children safe? Yes. Oh. Can I see them? No. And that was it. That's all he'd tell me. <laughs> Probably because he knew I'd kill them all. For starters, it's very likely that this mysterious voice is Catnap, simply because of how Mr. Light mocked his raspy voice and how Catnap never intended to harm the kids, same with the prototype. And secondly, Miss Delight is likely talking to Barb about this, the weapon she carries around with her, and this is because she slowly started to see the weapon as an actual person. Plus, the tape literally has Barb as the picture for it, so that's pretty much a dead giveaway. And when Ollie lets us know that we have to go into the school at some point in the game, he tells us that Catnap doesn't usually wander over there. This is likely because of how violent and crazy Miss Delight is and the fact that she'll pretty much kill anything, including the kids. But this makes me question where all of the kids even went in the first place. But more on that in another theory. The eighth tape we're looking at involves two employees, Stuart and Rich, and it's pretty much just a conversation between the two about Stuart considering giving his role to Rich. Rich starts off by completely complaining about the elevator, and they begin discussing the location and comments that the children should be able to see natural sunshine in a sky instead of one that's been painted and lit up with lights. Stewart then mentions that he needs to think about passing on the responsibility of his role to someone else since he's about to retire, and that person is Rich. That stupid clucky elevator. What was that, Richie? Nothing, nothing. Let's just get this shipment dropped and go. Hello, my name is Elliot Ludwig. Would you look around? I take it you're not a fan of this place, are you? Nope, 
never liked the feel of it. I mean, don't you think these kids deserve some real sunlight instead of floodlights and painted skies? Hell, we're not even allowed to talk to these kids. Isn't that... <clears throat> <sighs> Sorry, Stu. Sorry? <laughs> that doesn't sound like the rich I know. Well, I'm trying to stop being so pissed off all the time. My wife says I'm a lovely man, but I gotta control my temper. So, I'm doing it for her. <laughs> You're just different, Rich. Honest to a fault. But uh, I always liked that about you. Yeah? <laughs> well, you're one of the few. You know, Richie, with my retirement coming up, uh, they've been pushing hard for me to choose my replacement. I'm thinking about giving the role to you. But, uh, really? Really? Nothing official yet. But I think there's a decent guy beneath all that graph. An honest, hardworking man. You prove me right. I say your chances are pretty good. Wow. I, uh, geez, I don't know what to say. I, I'm just glad to see not everyone in this place has it out for me. Not everybody, Rich. Not everybody. Now, this ninth tape is a check-in for Catnap, and it starts off with Leith Pierre visiting his prison cell, and he starts talking about how Theodore has done extremely well with his new body, and how this was his fourth year in the body of Catnap. But Catnap doesn't respond to this, causing Leith to ask if his voice box is still broken. But right after this, Catnap says, the prototype will save us. This results in Leith completely breaking character and letting Catnap know that no one is going to be saved, and the prison is where Catnap belongs, despite the fact that he's periodically let out to be with the kids in play care. And as for the prototype, his home was in the laboratory. Okay, this is Catnap, uh, experiment number 1188. What's his real name again? Ah, okay. <clears throat> hey, uh, Theo, how you doing, bud? Normally I'd have Dr. Sawyer do this, but he's, uh, out let's say. So you got me until they find his replacement. First off, congrats. This is officially your fourth year in your new body, and you've made some real progress, pal. I was told that when you and the other smiling critters, you know, dog day, picky piggy, yada yada yada, were added into play care, that you weren't really getting along too well with the kids like everybody else was. But look at you now. The kids love you, and that red smoke, I mean, that's fantastic, isn't it? Is his, uh, voice thingy still broken? Will save us. Theo, nobody's gonna save you. This prison is where you belong. We'll let you out here and there to go see the kids in play care, but your home is here. And as for the prototype, his home is in the labs. This is your life now. Get used to it. Now, I'm led to believe that this prison Leith is talking about is the same prison that we see in the playhouse, as it has no other purpose of being there. And it's kind of weird how it's said that the experiments will forget who they were before being turned into a toy, and yet Leith still refers to Catnap as Theodore. But overall, this just shows how most of the toys were treated at Playtime Co., and why they were so ruthless during the hour of joy. The tenth tape includes a conversation between Stella Graber and and Mr. and Mrs. Hartman about a potential adoption for a child named Jeremy. But as Stella goes through the form, she realizes that it says testing, causing her to stumble over her words and worry the couple. After being told about the mix-up, the couple gets extremely frustrated at this and demand answers. But it seems like Stella has no idea why this happened. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Hartman. Come on in. Please have a seat. How was your ride down? It was, uh, nothing like we were expecting. Uh, Mr. Ludwig's speech was, well, it just confirms for us that you're the orphanage we want to go through. It's a truly magical place. I felt right at home from the second I entered. You open that door the first time and you just know you're never going to leave. 
kind of like finding a home as a child and always thinking of it when you want to feel comforted. <clears throat> I understand you want to give Jeremy that home. Yes, and we would like to adopt. Ah, amazing. You'll be perfect for... Oh. What? Well, it appears there's been some complications. Complications? What kind of complications? I... I don't know. Um, the form says... testing. <laughs> what does that mean? Tell us, what does that mean? Miss Graper, we deserve a better explanation than that. Don't you think? You're in charge of all this! How could you not know? And why are we only finding out about this now? I... I don't. I'm sorry. What's weird about this, though, is the fact that Stella was actively a part of and aware of the Bigger Bodies initiative, which means that she knew exactly what was happening with Jeremy. And it looks like she was only trying to act confused as to not compromise what's really going on inside of Playtime Co. But perhaps she was shocked because there was no filter for the kids that were actually going to be adopted and the kids that were going to be experimented on. Either way, it's clear that the fate of Jeremy was that of the rest of the orphan children. Now this next tape was a workforce danger alert that was aired for the employees on August 8th, 1995 at 11 a.m., the same time that the Hour of Joy occurred. There really isn't anything to speculate on, however, as it was just an emergency alert warning the workers of the Toys Rebellion. The following message is for all Playtime Company employees. At 11.01 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, an unknown hostile force was declared present within the Playtime Company facility. Personnel are to begin enacting emergency evacuation protocols immediately. Leave all personal belongings. Do not engage with any hostile individuals. If no exit path is available, seek shelter in a hidden location. Use blankets or pillows to cover your body and remain silent. Do not look through any windows. Do not open doors for any individuals. Do not make eye contact. The 12th tape is known as Log 24459, a log regarding a short conversation between Harley Sawyer and the prototype. Harley initially planned to record his findings regarding the prototype, then the prototype produces some weird noise, grabbing Harley's attention to find out more. In response to the question from 1006 on whether or not it is capable of feeling pain, Harley says that the prototype has a secret that he believes to be very precious. The prototype then thanks Harley and imitates his voice, saying that he discovers something new about him every day. Log code 24459. In relation, experiment 1006. The prototype. Stubborn as he is, and always silent with each passing session, I'm still uncovering fresh data nonetheless. Today's discovery... <laughs> End of log. Hmm. Ready to talk now, are you? I possess... A question. Go ahead. Do you feel anything? <sighs> this question referred to what exactly? You stick us. Beat us. Tear our flesh. There is a secret inside you, 1006. Valuable beyond all measure. I cut and prod and burn at it. And I get closer with each session. So speak. Or don't. Fight. Or give in. Regardless, I learn something new about you every day. <laughs> it excites me. Thank you. You thank me? Absolutely. I learn something new about you every day. 
And now for the last tape, which we know is the hour of joy. And for this, I'll just let it play out. But there's a secret hidden message that I put inside this tape. And the first person that types the message that I hid inside of the tape gets their comment pinned. That is all of the tapes in chapter three of Poppy Playtime. Thanks for watching, subscribe, and click on this video right here.